Last week was the Oscars, and I literally screamed, yes, when Jordan <laughs> Peele became the first black screenwriter to win Best Original Screenplay for Get Out. Black Panther just officially crossed the $1 billion mark at the box Woo! office. Okay? Yes. And A Wrinkle in Time is having its time. So with all these inclusive storytellers and characters reclaiming Hollywood, have we come close to a post-racial entertainment era? No. <laughs> well, that's our show today. <laughs> well, <laughs> We also play a game of Your Favorite's Problematic because let's face it, aren't they all? And as always, we will be reading your comments and questions. Let's get into it today on Team Vogue Take. I'm your host, Tiffany Bender. I'm Allie Maloney. I'm Jessica Andrews. I'm Wembley Sewell. And I'm Phil Picardi. Okay, so Wembley, you are on our social team here. Yes. From your vantage point, what does the landscape look like for diversity in Hollywood? Well, I don't think you even have to be inundated with social media and be in the trenches of it every day to see that something like really cool is happening right now. I mean, take a look at Black Panther, like the viral videos that came out of that of just like pure black joy, you know, the Kickstarters and the campaigns that are taking place to get people in the theaters and get people in the seats are indicative of that, the fact that something is on the horizon in terms of diversity in Hollywood. Um, the fact that it's such a launch pad for conversations like Time's Up and Oscars So White means that we are now kind of having a voice that we've never had before in terms of speaking out about what a diverse Hollywood should look like. Um, but I don't think that social media is the end all to be all when it comes to diversity in Hollywood. I think we also need to click on the TV and see what's up. Um, and according to GLAAD, there is some good news that there's apparently like a 36% increase in diversity overall. So that means over a third of roles in TV are now people of color. So that's pretty good, I would say. But I, I think it is good. But when you look at the numbers, there are 55 million Hispanics and Latinos in the United States. But they make up only 3.1% of the characters we see on television mm -hmm. with speaking roles and names. Right. Um, we see it again with uh, African Americans. While the numbers do match the percentages that they make up in the nation with what we see on TV, how how in complex and inclusive are the characters actually mm -hmm. when they're written out? Right, is it like a bit role? Right. Or are they actually getting <laughs> solid screen time, exactly. quality representation? Actually, I remember there was a social media campaign about Asian American representation in Hollywood that kind of stemmed out of Oscar So White. Because, you know, when April started that, people were like thinking that this was about Oscars so black, like, you know, not being black. black right. But yeah. April's point was like, no, Oscars are so white, which means that they're white, they're cis heteronormative, right. you right. know, Asian people aren't represented, Latinx people aren't represented. Right. Right. And and, um, and I remember that Constance Wu was talking a lot about her own struggles yeah, in, in yeah. Hollywood. And you know, finally, she's getting a billing role, but it's in it's in the movie Crazy Rich Asians, which is great, and that's uh, that's awesome that a movie exists that's you know dedicated to this Asian American community. But she's not; she's probably being you know, and she said she felt overlooked for other roles that you know white actresses would easily lay claim to. Absolutely, you know? mm -hmm. absolutely. There was a UCLA Hollywood diversity report that said 1.4 of 10 lead actors in films are people of color, and only 1.3 of 10 film directors are people of color. Wow. 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 So I think it, it raises this issue of almost the white gaze. So now we have yeah. these opportunities for characters on Did you screen. mean white gaze or white gaze? Okay. But it's important that people of color that are represented in front of the film have people of their communities also representing them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. I think representation is important um, in front of the camera and behind it. I think we saw that with Black Panther. Like the reason those right. characters were so dignified and powerful was because mm -hmm. you had Ryan Coogler directing it. Right. And I think that when black people aren't behind the scenes, you can tell because the representation isn't adequate. Black Panther's getting a lot of great attention, which I love because it's making so much money. A Wrinkle in Time also is, you know, at the top of the box mm -hmm. office. So yeah. Ava's number two and Ryan's number oh, one at the box yeah. office right now. <laughs> and the fact that we had to have a billion dollar movie right. in order for Hollywood to waken up to the fact mm -hmm. that if you create movies that include people and represent different points yeah. of view and perspectives that you're going to make money, yeah. right. it's, it's wild that, that, that capitalism has to be the kind of driving incentive for these white people people to wake up and then you begin to wonder like what's the, what's now the kind of Wait, incentive the, the benchmark's going to move yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly yeah. the flagpole's yeah. moving yeah of course yeah. of course right. yeah. um and to your point also about april's kind of wanting to even the word diversity to be more inclusive, mm -hmm. I think there's this narrative that diversity equals black. Right. And that also yeah. limits the things that we are able to do and the stories we're able to hear. Mm. Right. So uh, you, 
boss man. Yeah. How do we in India <laughs> so change the narrative? <laughs> How do we change the narrative that diversity doesn't just mean black? So Jill Soloway has an initiative that she's working on called 5050 by 2020. And I and I really like the spirit of her initiative because instead instead of it just being about uh, black and white, Jill's whole point is that you know like diversity means uh, disabled people. Diversity mm -hmm. means of course Asian American people, Latinx people. It means people of different creeds, and of course it means the LGBTQ community. So with 5050 by 2020 for for Jill, like what her kind of focus is is how do we get people who aren't cisgender, heterosexual white men behind the camera right. and obviously in, in yeah. front of the camera mm -hmm. too because that helps to change how things are seen and, and ultimately how things are consumed by the wider culture. I think it's so dope that the 5050 by 2020, their first mission is to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. That is yeah. one of their first uh, points. So at the end of her Oscar speech, Frances McDormand, she uttered a little phrase, I don't know if everybody caught it at home, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called the Inclusion Writer. Inclusion Writer is kind of this proactive approach in production, um, holding actors, holding higher ups, the major studios accountable for making sure that people are represented in a way both in front and behind the camera. Hmm. So, you know, I won't work on this film or I won't accept this unless there are X amount of people from, you know, different communities. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think what Frances did was pretty amazing because she put a term that not many people know right in the mm -hmm. forefront and it's this, this behind the scenes thing that makes such a big difference for people that work in the industry. But it's a matter of seeing what happens next. Are people going to follow up? Are people going to actually take that inclusion writer and apply it to their own careers and their own sets? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm really curious to see if what she said there will make a change because it did make a huge splash. It was the moment of the night. Oh, I didn't think, I didn't think people heard it. <laughs> <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's great, you know, especially from a Hollywood institution like Frances McDermott to do that, right? right? Yeah. And, and I, I am optimistic because women in Hollywood, and of course it's women who are doing this, which is so disappointing that more men aren't standing up and talking about this in Hollywood, right. just like with Time's Up. Mm -hmm. But you know, of course it's women who are doing this. And, and Reese Witherspoon has demonstrated, you know, a real kind of intense propensity to really bring these stories to the forefront as well. And obviously Jessica Chastain uh, right. negotiated for Octavia Spencer's higher, higher wage. To your point though about Jessica Chastain and um, Frances McDermott, are white women now though co-opting the diversity talk? Uh, uh, I, <laughs> I kind of think sort of. I think there's a moment right now. Traitor. No. <laughs> Use your space to, to create space yeah, for yeah, others, yeah. right? But um, whose voices are we hearing and why? Right, and yeah. have, have those women in their own lives been responsible in ways that, is it lip service? Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm, I'm skeptical of some of them. Well, I think it first starts with listening to other voices, right. listening to marginalized groups and not being defensive, but really hearing them out. Mm -hmm. And then also there's this erasure that happens in Hollywood that white people are very aware of. Mm -hmm. So it's like speaking up and giving other people a platform as well mm -hmm. and giving them visibility as well is so important. And we saw it with Emma Stone when she basically acted like Jordan Peele didn't exist, mm -hmm. how like detrimental that is to the conversation. Right. So right. that has to change like first and foremost. And she really minimized his own experiences mm -hmm. of like being marginalized <laughs> right. in this industry. Right. Right. What yeah. the film is about too. Is, you know, <laughs> well, I, I, I was, mean, it was the film well, about right. the film. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. It, was, it was very shocking. You, there is an element of this, and maybe this is slightly controversial to say, but there is an element of like, if Frances McDermott and Jennifer Lawrence and Reese Witherspoon and Nicole Kidman are saying these things, it does, I think it brings um, a conscientiousness to a general public that would previously be very wary of having these conversations. Okay. But you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that this is signaling a, a major shift and, and I believe that those women are going to continue to hold Hollywood accountable in a big way. Yeah, yeah. I hope. Yeah, All right, I hope guys, so. I think that. That was shade. That was shade. That was shade. That was The lights have dimmed in here from the shade, and so I think <laughs> it's about time to play my favorite Fingers game. Crossed. Your fave is problematic, not mm. mine, y'all's, because my people are perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. But, guys, tell me who you got this week. Oh, do I have to go first? Yes. This one was really hard for me because I found it hard to justify anyone's behavior. I would just write them <laughs> off as not liking them. I, anyone that I thought that I liked. And, and you know, they're the David Bowies of the world who I admire and respect, but I was trying to think modern, right, current. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Very, yeah. Team, very now. Um, so mine that I picked was Aziz Ansari because even though all of the BS that his behavior started a conversation um, that was super critical, um, but I still find myself laughing at Parks and Rec. He makes me giggle pretty Aww. hard. I know, and I, I'm embarrassed to say it, but he's my problematic fave. I uh, couldn't think of a fave that was problematic. Oh. I hope you guys don't kill me. But it's okay. <laughs> I just feel 
like once you become problematic, you're no longer my fave. Okay. Mine <laughs> is not a person. Uh, it is a thing. Okay. A friend. Oh. Netflix. Uh, yeah. I just found out that they're running a documentary on Rachel Dolezal. Yeah. Um, wh why? Why is the that, money? Wh why the resources? Why the attention? Yeah. Why the platform? Why the, why, the, why the space to to amplify her voice mm. instead of uh, black woman? Anyone? Right. Also, anyone. just like maybe just anyone else. Yeah. Actually. Okay. The, uh, my problematic fave really hurts because this is someone who I've loved and admired for a really long time and has been formative to like my own career and my own ambitions. And that's that's RuPaul. But RuPaul has. A little bit of a trans misogyny problem, and by a little bit I mean a pretty significant one. Mm -hmm. Recently he said that uh, he wouldn't invite, um, or he doesn't think that trans women who ha are, are undergoing transitions or in hormones um, or who are, are, have had surgery would be fair contestants on Drag Race. He thinks that it would be swaying the competition in their favor. And then he later in a tweet likened them um, to Olympic athletes who dope. This is problematic for so many ways, but it really has exposed, which I'm, I'm actually very grateful for, the misogyny problem and the trans misogyny mm -hmm. problem in the gay community at large. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, ho you know, RuPaul issued an apology. Obviously, RuPaul's a history of immense a uh, advocacy and activism, um, starting with McAviva Glam and being a, being a drag queen on a billboard in every major city in the world. You know, and 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 I and I really admire RuPaul for the work that he's done so far. But I think at this moment in time in the LGBTQ movement, what we're experiencing is gay men are taking a back seat, of course, mm -hmm. rightfully so, to help uplift the voices of our trans community, trans and non-binary community members. And um, I wish RuPaul was more gracious um, and more forward thinking. Yeah. Uh, my problematic fave this week is definitely going to Emma Stone. I love her. I just think that she's so adorable and such a fun actress. But the way that she kind of pushed uh, Jordan Peele to the side in announcing the award winners for me was just like, girl. You didn't have yeah. to. Um, Especially like, I mean, just know your history too. Right. Like, Aloha right. just happened. Yeah, right. like, you just right. working with Woody <laughs> Allen. Right, right. Honestly, right? that like, was yeah. that was yeah. filmed before last. Maybe it was very recent. Yeah. 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 So, that's like, like that was like, like those stones, man. Right. Yeah, that was, that, was that was definitely a sis. Relax. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but I do love her. I, I love her so much. Uh, we also want to hear what your problematic faves are, who your problematic faves are. So be sure to use the hashtag Team Vogue Take and drop that. We will also see you next week. Be sure to like, subscribe, follow, all that good stuff. See you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.